It's Colorado's biggest test of this college football season, but will they pass? You are Locked On Buffs, your daily podcast on the Colorado Buffaloes, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Buffs. I am your host, Kevin Borba. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. We are also brought to you by the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day for free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. And thank you for making me your first listen of the day. Joining me today, Dalton Wasserman of PFF. Dalton, thank you for diving in. I think this is sneakily going to be one of the better games of this absolutely loaded college football slate this weekend. What do you think? <laughs> I, I agree with you. I think it's a huge game as far as the Big 12 goes. It's it's a great game in a big environment, too. Folsom Field's going to be rocking. And I think what you have in this game is this weekend is really going to set the course for everything we see going forward in the Big 12. When you talk about you've got Colorado, K-State, Utah's playing Arizona State, and Arizona State's playing good football. BYU, Arizona, and Arizona's on pins and needles right now with their season. And Iowa State, West Virginia is a huge game. Those are four massive games that are going to set the course for the rest of the Big 12 this season and, and how the conference standings shake out, who's going to the Big 12 title game. But this Colorado-Kansas State game might be the biggest game of all of them. Yeah, I think there's a lot of implications on the line here, right? Kansas State is still, obviously, they're one and one conference play. So they're in the mix still. But two losses in conference play is detrimental. Um, that two losses is borderline. Like you're getting to the point where you need this team to win, this team to lose, and that's where it starts to get tricky. For Colorado, they control their own destiny right now, and I think they have a lot at stake. So I see this as their biggest test of the season thus far. Would you agree? And if so, why or why not? Uh, I absolutely agree. Look, I thought I thought leading into it, UCF was going to be their biggest test of the season because stylistically, you know, with the run game and the, and the monster that they have in the backfield, RJ Harvey and KJ Jefferson, and and I think Kansas State is very much a similar team to UCF, but a better version of it, right? I think K State's defense is more fundamentally sound than UCF's is. They've got a three-headed rushing monster with Avery Johnson. DJ Giddens and Dylan Edwards, and, and you have to like when you watch them schematically how they've been using Dylan Edwards, whether it be in the slot or in the backfield or even as a receiver here and there. He's he's a guy I think that's been an X factor for this offense so far, and I just think they're a little bit more fundamentally sound across the board than UCF is, right? I think this is a tougher test, and the big thing for me also, Avery Johnson a little bit different than K.J. Jefferson. Jefferson, a big 250-pound, kind of run-you-over kind of guy. Avery Johnson's got track speed, and he can take a 60-yard touchdown to the house on any play. Yeah, I think realistically, uh, that's the biggest difference. And and I think that'll be the key for at least Kansas State, right? Is getting Avery Johnson involved with his legs. Because I don't think UCF, I don't know if they tried to do it, but I don't think they did it well enough if they did try, which was get KJ Jefferson's legs involved. Because I think those were their biggest run plays um, for the most part against Colorado was KJ Jefferson, quarterback draw, or maybe just scrambling around and making plays with his legs. And so I think Colorado has to slow down Avery Johnson because I do think he's a little bit more willing to run right now because I think there's a sense of nervousness when he has to throw. Um, I just don't think if it's not a read that he likes, he's he's probably going to take off and run. Would you agree with that? <laughs> That's exactly it. Right now, um, he's, he's a bit of a one-read quarterback, and they put a lot of easy stuff in the passing game for him. There's bootlegs and things that cut the field in half. There's a lot of RPO where it's one read or take off and run. Um, you, you've got an element where Johnson is not the most comfortable just drop back passer, right? And that's why I think it's a premium with Kansas State. There is no team, I, I, I like to say, there's no team more dependent on game script than Kansas State. If they get ahead mm -hmm. and they can stay in their wheelhouse, they can beat you. They can beat you bad, right? If they fall behind and they get, let's say they get down two scores and they have to start dropping back and throwing, it's exactly what happened in the BYU game. He has to force things from the pocket. Some, he's just not the most – he's not the guy that's going to get to his second and third read. It's usually one read or take off and run. And, and you saw some turnover issues and some pressure start to get to him in that BYU game. This game is such a premium on who gets an early lead either way, right? Because I think you, you could see a scenario again where either team, if they get an early two-score lead – they run away with it, right? Yeah, it could be K-State with the run game, and, and we've seen it before. They can run away and run for 400 yards on you, or it can be Colorado stopping the run and getting ahead and keeping keep on the gas like they did against UCF. Scoring early in this game is going to be huge. Yeah, and I think with Colorado's defense, if they get a lead early, that plays into their hand because Colorado's defense is very much um, – I think they're top 30-ish. I think they're 26th in the country, but for top 30 for sure in turnovers force, right? They are a team that prides themselves on – 
forcing turnovers in bunches. They've they force four turnovers in both of the games that they have turnovers for. So it's like they don't get just like one a game. It's like once they start coming, they're they're all over the place. So it's really going to be interesting to see if Colorado can sort of force Avery Johnson to make a mistake. In terms of this being their biggest test, I'll explain why I think it's their biggest test. Um, I did a little bit about this yesterday. One, it's their first ranked opponent. Obviously, Nebraska ended up being ranked after they played, but they didn't. They haven't played anyone ranked yet. Two, it's a Big Twelve opponent that. I would say the general population still thinks is probably one of the better Big 12 teams that could play for a Big 12 title. And then three, and this one shouldn't matter as much, but I think it will sort of exercise some demons, as I've been saying. It gets Colorado past that four and eight threshold, right? They win this game. They're at five. So they've already improved the record from last season. Can you t- sort of dive into what a win would do for Colorado here? Um, here's Here's the difference for me. I think this is the best way to put it. The UCF win, especially as big as they won, proved mm-hmm. that they can compete in the Big 12, okay, that they might be capable of it. A win in this game proves that they will compete in the Big 12 without question oh, for their last six games going towards the Big the Big 12 title game. This is proof that they will. K-State is a perennial contender. They're one of the most fundamentally sound teams in, in the Big 12 every single year. they Look, they play physical as hell. They get after you with their offensive line and their run game. Every single year, K-State's a contender. You want to beat teams? Look, UCF was a step up from beating Baylor. Baylor kind of thought to be one of the bottom half teams. UCF was thought to be a dark horse that maybe could compete, but Colorado handled them very well. Now you get into one of the contenders, right? And when we start talking about the games for Colorado, when you get into uh, Kansas State, potentially Arizona, um, Utah later in the year, these are the these are the teams that were thought to be the contenders. So if you start punching with the heavyweights now and you start beating them, you talk about now so solidly, not just speculation, Colorado is one of those contenders with Shador Sanders, with their run defense, with everything they've improved on this year. They get in that mix. Right now they're knocking on the door. They win this game. They've kicked the door down to contention for sure. What a big, what a stark in, in difference. Like what, what a big difference from Colorado to beginning the year where it's like, you know, bowl eligibility, that, that's the goal. Like I projected them to go seven and five, right? And I was like, I can see them making a bowl game this year. I, I was confident that they had talented players. I was like, they had some improvements. I was not expecting for Robert Livingston, who I did episode last week, and maybe you could touch on this a little right here before we move on. I think he's pushing for, or at least the early contender for hire of the year. Um, I think that his sort of ability to play to Colorado's strengths when it didn't look like they had any strengths last year is moved mountains for this defense. And I do think that Deion Sanders deserves a lot more credit for bringing him in because no coordinating experience. He'd been in the NFL for over a decade uh, I didn't. Even, I think most people in probably NFL circles would assume that, or would say that they didn't even know he wanted to coach at the college level. So, what a find! What a hire by Coach Prime. Would you agree that Robert Livingston's in that threshold of Coach of the Year candidate, if you will? Or coach yeah, the- I, I, I think he's. I think he's in that group. I think a guy even too like Andy Kotelnicki at Penn State is in that group. There's always a handful of new hires that that do such yeah. a great job with their with their new staffs, right? And I think. I think the one thing for Livingston that's really impressive is that the number, obviously, the, I think what gets forgotten about having to bring in so many guys in the transfer portal like Colorado does is not only are they talented guys. I mean, we've talked about before other talented guys, B.J. Green and Dayon Hayes and the linebackers and all of that, but it's on Livingston more than anybody else to get these guys to gel and find the chemistry when you're talking about they had, what, five weeks of practice in, in you know in the, in the summer. You had spring ball, too, and when a lot of those guys were in, but – You've only got, let's say, a few months to really get the chemistry going and to get these guys playing together, all right? They can be talented all they want, but if they don't play together, then none of it matters, right? And I think that's the biggest thing that I'm seeing, especially in that front seven where you have basically everybody's new. There was hardly any of those guys there last year except for Levante Bentley. You're talking about having to bring together all these new guys in a matter of months, and and we've been talking about by week five or six, He's accomplished that, right? And they're playing so well together, and that's why they've been so much. They've been so much better in the trenches. Not only are they more talented, but they're more they're more synced up, right? And when you're more synced up, you could see it with the D line, the linebackers. When everyone's doing their job, it makes everybody else around them better, and that's something you didn't see last year. Livingston's done a great job, and and I'll tell you what, we'll get into some schematic adjustments that he's gotten into, especially against UCF. He's doing a great job in the playbook, on the field, call in place all the way around this. You're right. He's, he is what he has been so far. One of the best hires in college football. Yeah. I think he just, 
I, I don't want to say I was doubting him. I never had a doubt in him or a doubt for him. It was just like a, a question mark about him because it's like, okay, he's never coordinated defense. He hasn't done anything at the college level. Like he, it was just a big mystery. And I remember when Coach Prime was teasing the hire, he made it seem like it was a coach who was like in the midst of a playoff run. So it's like, okay, it's a position coach that's coordinated before, or like, is he going to poach a defensive coordinator from the NFL? Like all of these thoughts were churning through my head. I did not realize he was going to take a flyer on someone who had never coordinated, but clearly. It was a perfect flyer to take, and we'll see um, if Robert Livingston can keep up his hot streak of calling plays and um, helping sort of carry this Colorado team for the most part, I would say, for the first through first few weeks. Um, when we come back, we're going to be talking about what it takes for this Colorado team to win, but first, a quick break. Hey, NFL fans, you could start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you could check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first first $5 bet. That's FanDuel.com to get in on the action. Welcome back to Locked on Bus. Appreciate you guys for joining me Joining me today on the show, Dalton Wasserman of PFF. Dalton, we're talking about what it takes for Colorado to win. Sort of give me, let's start with the offense first. We'll break it up on each side of the ball. Um, special, I'll do special teams for both of us. Don't give up detrimental plays. And I think that's as simple as that. Um, don't give up big kick returns and make the kicks when you got them. Um, it's pretty simple for special teams. They did that last week against UCF, and I think that was a difference, right? I think that end of first half field goal, was really a blow to UCS gut. Um, it was like, oh shoot, now we're down by even more. And so if special teams could be a weapon rather than a liability, you're going to do well. Um, let's talk about the offense though. What does this offense need to do in order to win or keep the, keep Kansas state on the ropes? I think the biggest thing to look at in this game with Colorado's offense is they have, they actually have an advantage or, or it's kind of even ground when it comes to pass protection because Kansas state's pass rush has not been great. They're actually towards the bottom of the power five and in, in our pass rush grading, it, it, they, they send four and they just hope that they get there and they play coverage behind it. And, and it's not really been all that effective a pass rush uh, in drop back situations. And we already know, look, we've said it before you you give Shadour a clean pocket He's going to kill you. He can read defenses. He's accurate. He makes all the right throws. He only has two turnover-worthy plays this year, and they were the two interceptions, the two bad interceptions early in the game against Nebraska and UCF. That's it. That's really the only two big mistakes he's made all season. When he's clean, he's the best quarterback in the country, I think, without question, right? And K-State's pass rush has not been great. And the other thing, too, they're not great. They're also not creative. They don't blitz very much. They don't stunt very much. Four guys get in their gaps, and they go. And if you can block them, you can block them. And, and, you know, so it's always good. I, we know look, Colorado's pass protection comes and goes. It has stretches where it's pretty bad. It has stretches where it's pretty good, right? But yeah. it's a lot easier when you know it's not maybe an elite unit across from you. And schematically, they're not doing a whole lot of things to bother you, right? Like part of the reason, even going back to the North Dakota State game, North Dakota State, they have like an elite power five level pass rush? Maybe not. But they mess around a lot on the defensive line. All the stunts and stuff they use, that's why they still gave problems, right? This team doesn't do a whole lot up front. They want to sit back and they want to keep things in front of them and not give up big plays and make tackles. The advantages are for Colorado. The pass protection should have a reasonably good shot of holding up. And even if they take that soft approach in coverage, Shadur is very willing to throw those six-yard curls and just do things to get first downs. He will wait to take his shots until they have it available to them. You're not going to see a ton of man-to-man -man coverage. K-State secondary isn't, isn't even the most talented secondary they're sound, they make tackles, right? So I, I think Colorado, the big kryptonite you always worry about is protecting Shadur and this offensive line. Now, it would help to have a little bit of balance in the run game too, like they had against UCF. That would help, but K-State's run defense is very good. That's that's probably the best part of their defense. But if Shadur is protected, you always have a very good shot to win. Yeah, I think that's kind of been Colorado's big thing for the past two years now is protect Shador. And even against Baylor, who runs a lot of stunts, they they like to get spicy on the defensive front. They had eight sacks and they still lost. So there's a chance that even if you get to Shador, and I talked about this on a show I was on yesterday, where your sacks on Shador have to be timely, which I mean, that's not really something you could control um, for the most part, where it's not like, hey, it's third and 15. This would be a really good time to sack. Like you don't get to pick when you're going to sack the quarterback, but when you play against Colorado, if you are able to sort of take the momentum out of their sails early, that's when it sort of affects the offense, right? If you force a big turnover early in the game 
or if you sack Shador and sort of kill a scoring drive where they needed points, that's where it sort of um, comes into play. Let's talk about the coverage real quick, because obviously if it's just four men straight up um, rushing, rushing the passer, what does that look like for this Colorado offense, right? You said Shador's going to have to take the short passes. Are we looking for a lot of runs after the catch here from Jimmy Horn and guys like that, or is there ways to sort of scheme these big plays open, or do you just have to be patient? You can scheme them open as long as you have pass protection uh, that that holds for something closer to three, three and a half seconds, right? You can absolutely scheme those things open, and they have the guys who can get downfield. When you talk about Will Shepard and Jimmy Horn, obviously Travis Hunter, right? K State, and look uh, in the rare moments that they do play man coverage, and maybe they try to blitz something you're going to see a shot to Travis Hunter because you're not going to see from K-State a boatload of man coverage. When they do have that chance, when they had that chance a couple of times against UCF, they got after it, right? You can still create one-on-one matchups, though, against a heavy zone team. You just need time and in-pass pro to do it, right? And there's other times, too, when, look, we've seen it with Shadur. The big plays can come from the improv, too. Look, he can roll out. He can find people. that The chemistry – between him and Hunter, especially when they're rolling out and improvising. I mean, it's it's like Aaron Rodgers, Devontae Adams type of stuff. It's like, it's just, they're so in sync. They've done it for years now, not just a year and a half in Colorado. They've done it at Jackson State too, right? Those guys are so in sync when it comes to the improv that he's looking for number 12 anytime he breaks the pocket. Those, those are the big plays that can happen too, and they need to be taken into account. But you can create those shots. I do think early in the game though, it's going to be more about rhythm, quick rhythm, eight yards at a time, keep moving the sticks, and kind of playing with tempo. Even if K-State's bringing only that four-man rush, you play with tempo, you start to wear those guys out, and Shador's going to have time to take shots down the field because he's going to have time in the pocket. Yeah, I think when in doubt, throw to Travis. I feel like that's a, a pretty solid plan. Um, it, it, it works out most of the time. Let's go to the defensive side of the ball, which Travis Hunter is still on because he's obviously a freak athlete that does a little bit of everything. Um, Colorado won. They're going to be healthy this week. They bring Shiloh Sanders back. And then Deion Sanders said that they're going to have the entire starting unit back. I think, which is probably for the first time since week two, I think since week two, they've had people in and out of the lineup. Dayon Hayes has missed time. Chidozen Wonko has missed time. So talk to me about what this defense needs to do to slow down Kansas state. Cause we know Avery Johnson can run Dylan Edwards. Colorado fans are familiar with can run. Um, Giddens is also a powerful back. He's like six foot one, six foot maybe six foot, 215 pounds. He's a big running back. He's a big dude. So talk to me about what they need to do to sort of limit this offense and make it a game where they're not playing their game. So this is a game. UCF was a great test for the linebackers, right? I've talked about their linebackers a lot. So Colorado as a team is 13th in the country in our run defense grade, and their linebackers are six. It's an amazing jump. We've talked about Nakai Hill Green getting into the starting lineup with Levante Bentley, and they've been an elite duo. They've been in sync. They're filling gaps. They're making tackles. They're doing all the things, okay? A couple of things that Colorado has been really good at, okay, is, is keeping contained. Off, the, off of the edge. They're in the top 10 in run defense of, of defending off the edges, too. They keep contained. They keep things in the box. And these linebackers are filling gaps. Kansas State is as hard a team to defend for linebackers as any team in the country. It's the entire key. When you watch, go back and watch their uh, their game against Arizona, Arizona's linebackers were lost. And that's why they got run over like that and they lost the game. Okay? This is so hard with so many pulling guards and so many option looks. And they can go two different ways on any play. Linebackers have to balance watching the offensive line and reading their keys and then reading the football just to make sure Avery Johnson didn't get behind them or Dylan Edwards didn't take the jet. It's a hard balance, right? And, and a lot of times you, I'm, I'm curious to see in this one how much help that they get because one of the fun parts – this game to me, it's about their linebackers and it's about Robert Livingston, okay? They're known – Colorado's known for playing a lot of single high, right? A lot of cover one, a lot of man coverage, things like that, right? Yeah. And – and the fun part about what they did against UCF, and I don't know if this is Robert Livingston taking a page out of the Lou Anarumo playbook from the Bengals. I don't know if he's listening to somebody like Warren Sapp and maybe taking some suggestions within the staff. They went a lot of heavy cover two against UCF. More too high, I think, than I've seen them play at any point with, with Coach Prime as their head coach, okay? 55% cover two in that UCF game. And that, that was brand new. That was new. And part a little bit is the, a little bit of that is a little heavier than you might expect because late in the game, they were playing it a lot. They were ahead by 20. Okay. But they were doing it early in the game. And I think he trusts these linebackers to make it, to make their reads and make tackles because they've shown us they can do it right. This game though, this is even more different than the UCF game. Cause again, you cannot make mistakes 
with Avery Johnson with as that option guy as the quarterback. Again, he's KJ Jefferson's a good runner. He's a powerful runner. He's not a home run hitter. Avery Johnson's a home run hitter. He can make he could make this game seven nothing on the first play of the game if you lose him. It can happen. The level of speed has to be dealt with. So I'm curious if he stays, if he feels like he trusts those guys enough and stays in the too high approach, or if they go back to a single high and you see, you know, Silman Craig rolled down or Shiloh rolled down, and obviously Preston Hodge is floating around the box a lot. It's going to be a lot, I think. It's either going to be he trusts them so much and you have legitimately one of the best pair of linebackers in the country, or you get a little bit of help and you're going to need some skill guys to make tackles because it takes for this K-State offense – it takes everybody, but it's as hard a test on your linebackers as any team in the country because of the way they scheme things up and all the gap schemes. That's going to be the key is how much help do those linebackers need and how much can the safeties and those other guys help them when they do have it? Yeah, I think a little help doesn't hurt, right? I think maybe it's a weird combination. And like you said, they Colorado changed up a lot of things against UCF. I think offensively, they went 11 personnel for like the first time all year. And the even the UCF defensive coordinator was like, they did not do that at all on film. They did not show that at all. And so I don't know if they were saving it for Big 12 play. I know a lot of people like to be like, oh, they weren't. They, they want to keep it for conference play. I don't know if teams actually are like withholding a whole section of their playbook for conference play. But we're, we're kind of seeing this pattern where Colorado's ex- experimenting and trying new things. So I think having some, some help wouldn't hurt and then build a little lead and then rely on your guys to make plays. But you have to figure out what works. So whatever fig- whatever works for Colorado, that's obviously – the move there. Um, my one last question about the de- the defense before we moved on. Um, what do you think Shiloh Sanders brings to the table? I talked about his leadership ability. I talked about he's better in coverage than people give him credit for. Um, I think he sort of has the unfair comparison of he wears number 21. He's the son of Deion Sanders and he plays not the same position, but he's a, a defensive back like his father was. And he's obviously not his father in coverage, but he's still a lot better than people give him credit for. So what does Colorado get and bringing him back or having him come back? I think you get an ag- another aggressive presence, another guy that can hit you. And, and I just think the theme, the, the overarching theme, right, for all the things that we talk about about this defense improving is they're just more physical. And Shiloh's another guy who brings that, right? He can fly up from that single high spot and make tackles. He's a pretty sure tackler. I know people kid on him for, you know, some penalties and some late hits and stuff. But when he doesn't do that, he's a pretty sure tackler. And he's willing to get up in the box and, and play in the box, right? And, and I think he is definitely – if they're going to start making adjustments in coverage too now, I think he's definitely smart enough to handle that. I have no question about that. He's been, he's been, he's look who he was raised by. I mean, he's going to know how to run coverages, right? Yeah. It's, I think it's just another guy. They have guys at all three levels playing so physical right now. All those defensive mm-hmm. linemen, Bentley and Hill Green, Preston Hodge in the slot. And then you've got Silman Craig and, and Shiloh at safety now everybody's going to hit you. And, and that's what you want. That's the first thing any defensive coordinator is going to talk about. Like, listen, we got to be willing to hit people. And Shiloh's always been willing to hit people. I, I would say yeah. even last year when the entire team wasn't as physical, he's one of the more physical players on their team. And, and he just brings – it's just another guy. Well, I think the two things you have on this Colorado D this year, physicality and depth. And you get one of the big names back there at safety. And, and with the way Silman Craig is playing, and if they're going to get in more too high looks – now you don't have to ask Shiloh to do so much as that deep center fielder in the run and pass game. Because even in the run game, we saw it at times against even going back to North Dakota State. You break through those first two levels and you're single high. The last guy back there is Shiloh Sanders, and he can make those tackles. But another guy in run support, especially in the alley, right? And when I talk about guys, if they need to tackle Avery Johnson on that backside, what an option. There's a lot of space back there. Who are the guys a lot of times that have to prevent those big plays? It's the safety. So I would feel very good about having Shiloh back, having Cameron Silman Craig back there, and even Preston Hodge in the slot, depending on, you know, if they have to run strong side and he has to be that extra guy. Those three guys are going to be a big presence in this run defense along with those front six. Yeah, I think the, it's so crazy to see how far this defense has come. Um, last year we were talking about Travis J. Can he hold up at corner? Can Amarion Cooper hold up at corner? Now we're like Colorado has a really good secondary. And all, all the defense is just physical and can do their jobs, which is a completely different storyline from last year. So in summary, for Colorado to win this game, they need to do what? Fill in the blank there. Do not fall behind early. Okay. It's, it's With Kansas State, it's game script. 
They get ahead on you by 10, 14 early. And, and I do believe Shadur could bring them back considering K-State's lack of pass rush. But Kansas State is this locomotive, okay? If they get it going and they get ahead early, you have a huge problem. Now, if Colorado gets ahead by two scores, 10 nothing, 14 nothing early, I, I would highly consider, honestly, at the coin toss, I know conventional wisdom now is to, is to kick off. I would highly consider taking the ball first if I'm Colorado. Get, get ahead of this team. Make them feel like, darn it, we have to get away. The sooner you make Kansas State get out of what they want to do, the, the sooner you really have them. Because Avery Johnson and this receiving core, it is not a drop back team. They're not. They are not an obvious true drop back situation team. So I think in a big sense, do not fall behind early. It, it, the first quarter of this game, is probably the most important. It, it is so if one team or the other gets ahead by two scores, they're at a massive advantage. And I know by the numbers, any game I could say that, but this game is so much that with Kansas State. And I think the other thing, you know, a smaller bit that plays into that is first down. Um, mm -hmm. Very much curious. If, if they can get ahead on defense, especially on first down, and, and, yeah. and in a smaller sense, get K-State into third and eights, right? Then they have to drop back and throw the football. Anytime that you have as a defense have Avery Johnson just dropping back without play action, without RPO, without all the fun stuff. Yeah. The defense, the defense is at an advantage. Those are facts. And, and if you get there and he comes out in drop back situations and throws for 350, then you didn't deserve to win. But if you get him in those spots like BYU did, it's to the defense's advantage. Get ahead early, win on first down, do everything you can to make Avery Johnson beat you with his arm and you're at an advantage. Okay, we heard what they need to do to win. Now we're going to talk about will they win. But first, a quick break. This episode of Locked on Buffs is brought to you by our sponsors over at Game Time. Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks that's make getting that makes getting tickets even easier for your favorite live events. Filter out all the fluff to show you incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste your time searching through thousands of tickets. They have this really cool feature called Seat View where you can look at what your view would be on your phone. So there shouldn't be a random poll. There shouldn't be a weird curve or architectural inconsistency in the stadium that prevents you from having the perfect view because game time allows you to see everything. They also have their lowest price guarantee or they'll credit you 110% of the difference. Your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account and use code locked on college for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again, create an account, and redeem code locked on college for twenty dollars off. Download game time today. What time is it? It is game time. Okay, Dalton, it's time to forecast the future. It's time to get out the crystal ball. I already am on record saying I think Colorado wins this game. I think it's going to be a close game, 35-31. Uh, I do think, and this is why I'm confident in this Colorado team. If the game was close in the first half, which was actually your key to, to winning for Colorado or for both teams, actually, it was keeping it close or at least getting an early lead. If this game is close in the first half, I am fully confident that Robert Livingston will make second half adjustments that take away something from Kansas State. We've seen it every single game where another team, the other team, whoever it is, UCF, uh, Baylor, whatever, they find some success in the first quarter, first half. And then Robert Livingston goes into halftime and comes out and they give up max seven points. Seven points has been the most points they've given up in the second half all year long. And so I am really confident that if Colorado could keep this game close or at least tied or a small lead in the first half, they will win this game. I do think that it's going to be somewhat of a nail biter though, because it's the big 12 and I feel like every game is a 50, 50 game at the end of the day. So I do think it's going to be a closer game, but I do feel like Colorado is going to win this game. What do you think? I have Colorado winning this game 35 to 28, and there's three things for me. Um, one, I, I've talked about, about uh, before about the two big factors in in teams that are going to win the Big 12 are quarterback play, and Shadur is mm -hmm. the best quarterback in the conference, and run defense. And K-State's run defense is very good too, but it's at more of a premium here for Colorado. They have the best run defense grade for us in the Big 12, the 13th in the country, which is just an incredible jump after last year. I believe they were the 11th worst in the country. <laughs> Run defense and quarterback play. Colorado has a big advantage, I think, at quarterback and maybe a slight advantage or it's at least even in run defense. And K-State's lack of pass rush, uh, that's the second thing. The lack of a pass rush is a problem. We already know. We've seen it for a year and a half. You want to beat Colorado, you have to pressure Shadur all 
night. All of their worst games that they've played, even the Nebraska game, they got they got a good amount of pressure on him. They got a good amount of pressure on him last year. The Baylor game, you mentioned Dave Aranda calling stunts and, and, and all the fun stuff because he's a great defensive coach. They got after Colorado. It did take a Hail Mary to tie that game. The lack of pass rush for K-State is the second thing for me where I go Shadur. I don't see a whole lot of reason that he shouldn't be comfortable for the majority of this game. And Shadur is comfortable. Isn't there a Coach Prime quote from from the summer or earlier in the year? Don't don't let me get comfortable. Isn't there? Wasn't there yeah, a quote there, like that? Something along those lines. Yeah. <laughs> the same thing applies. Don't let Shadur get comfortable. If K State doesn't find more in the pass rush, they're in trouble. And I think one last thing that I was just looking at just now because I because I had to think about it. K State. Um, that, look, they're going into a a wicked environment. Folsom Field is going to be absolutely electric. And if you look at the splits on this on this K-State team, their three home games they've played, they've outscored teams 114 to 33. Okay. Their That's two road, their two road games were a big loss to BYU and a right. game against and a game at Tulane where they darn they darn near lost that game. Yes. Uh, and, and they, they, they and, and Tulane, they were ahead for a long time in that game. They almost tied. They were about eight yards from tying the game, I think it was, at the very end. They did, They have not looked good in either of their two road games, and this may be the toughest one yet. BYU is a great environment, but what this Colorado crowd is going to look like at night in the biggest game of, of this Coach Prime era, no. I, I think it's a factor. I really do think if you if you're talking about having an even game, I think playing a game in this environment is a huge factor. If Colorado, as long as look, if K State doesn't find something in the pass rush they haven't had before, Colorado, I put the number against UCF at 250 rush yards. Okay, when you have a team averaging that was averaging 380 and they only run for 250, cool, and they held them to what? It was 180 or 190, well, like 175, I think it was around there. Yeah. I'm, I'm putting the same rule on, on this K-State team, 250. You hold them under 250, I think you're going to win this game. You just can't let them get in that in that big range work. Because K-State, any given day, can run for 400 yards. They can. Yeah. Because they because they will call run plays every single play if you allow them. If it was up to Chris Kleiman, they wouldn't throw a single pass. They wouldn't. <laughs> so if you, if you hold them, if you reasonably hold them, right? I'm not saying you're going to hold them to 50 yards. That's not a thing. Not against this team. Same thing as UCF, hold them under 250, run the mm. quarterback, and I think that home field, it's going to be something. I don't even know that that we can quantify how that's what that's going to look like uh, on, on Saturday night. So I've got Colorado 35-28. Get that little crowd noise meme from <laughs> the college football video game going. Oh, it's, it's, uh, 10 out of, it's 10 out of 10 this week for sure. Yeah, for sure. They, they get buzzing out there in Folsom. They get very rowdy, and all it takes is one big play, right? All it takes is one big play. Shador to Travis Hunter play, and that crowd is locked in. So we both think Colorado is going to win this game. Um, Dalton, I appreciate you for tuning or for tuning in. I appreciate you for tuning in. If you do, I appreciate you for joining us. Um, tell the people where they can find you and what you're working on. <laughs> Uh, PFF.com is always all our great written content on the NFL and college side. And as far as the college side goes, myself and Max Chadwick, every uh, Sunday morning and Tuesday night, we have our college uh, review and preview shows. This week we previewed uh, eight of the biggest games in college football. That's up on our YouTube channel now, the PFF College Football Show, including our full preview of this Colorado-Kansas State game and all of all four of those Big 12 games that I mentioned. It is a massive weekend in the Big 12, and we have you covered with all of it. Check it out, the PFF College Football Show YouTube channel. Yeah, go check them out. They got great content every single week, and they dive into the numbers, and they go deeper than the numbers. It's really awesome. You guys should go check them out. You should check us out over here on Locked on Buffs every single day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you guys for liking, subscribing, and following. We're about 60 subscribers away from 6,000, so let's get there. And on tomorrow's episode, we have a Kansas State insider joining the show to talk about what they view or how they view this matchup, so you guys won't want to miss it. Hope everyone has a great Wednesday, and I will see you guys tomorrow.